So I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, this is one of the uh, presentations that's sponsored by the Youth Next organization. If you're not familiar with Youth Next, it's a cross university center focused on positive youth development. Um, looking around here, I see many familiar faces, so I think many of you do know about it. Um, so we're very interested in trying to think about how kids develop well and how do we think about involvement with supporting that. Um, so why invite Candace Augers? Well, uh, there are two kind of distinct reasons. One has to do with running into her at a meeting at, in Oxford, right? And we wound up riding on a train together. And um, just all these overlapping interests, um, as well as um, I think I've picked up at least three or four things I wanted to make sure I did my next study on that trip. So, so I, when I heard that she was in this area of the country, that, that made it very interesting of what, how can we bring up? Because she does a lot of things, but she does them very well. And that's why it is, is important. Any, any one area, you're just impressed by the depth of her thinking and the carefulness of her work, whether that's how disparities and differences in neighborhoods affect kids to what kinds of things really distinguish uh, different kinds of risk in kids to the kind of work she's going to talk about today uh, where we're thinking about kids and media to innovative ways of trying to measure uh, kids' behavior and, and so on. Um, she is currently uh, Associate Professor of Public Policy, Psychology, and Neuroscience at Duke University and she's also the Associate Director of the Center for Child and Family Policy there. She got her PhD from a very well-known university, uh, University of Virginia, and then she uh, went from there over to the University of London to work in the, um, make sure I get this right, so Social Genetic and Developmental Psychiatry Center, uh, working with uh, uh, Timmy Moffat and Avshalom Kospi, names should probably a number of you use. No, um, she also was a WT Grant faculty scholar um, and recently she received the Janet Taylor Spence Award from the Association for Psychological Science for transformative early career contributions to psychological science. So rather than belabor that, I'll just leave that phrase there for you to ponder as she uh, gives us her talk. Thanks, Pat. Um, I often not to wear a mic, so if you can't hear me, just kind of scream or dick, you yell at me. That's your job. <laughs> so um, thanks for the... Uh, Invitation to come back here. I always I have very fond memories of Virginia and very um, fond feelings for the community. So any chance that I get to come back here, I, I jump at it. So when Patrick asked me, I, I definitely um, was keen to come here and talk about some of this uh, newer work that we've been working on in terms of using um, mobile technologies both as a research tool and then starting to think about mobile technologies and the way that they might be influencing kids who are growing up in the digital age. So those are the two things I'm going to cover cover today, and I want to leave lots of time for questions, so I'm going to try and pay close attention to time with you. The talk's really um, in two parts, and the first part I'm going to talk about this idea of being born digital. So anyone here born before 1980? <laughs> you're a digital immigrant, um, born after that, uh, you're born digital. You were born at a time when you don't really remember life without the internet, but some of us, some of us do. And as immigrants come over, and so I've been an immigrant. Uh, trying to understand the lives of kids born digital in the last little while. I'm going to give you some examples from the Mind study. This was a study funded by the WT Ground Foundation, and a foundation that supported a lot of good work here. And then um, talk about opportunities this might have for research. And then as part of the story, um, story line, I'm going to talk about mobile technology not only as a tool, but this idea that kept coming up as we talked to parents of kids in our studies of the effects that mobile technologies might be having on kids. Right? And so the second part of the talk is going to shift a little bit and think about mobile technologies and their potential effect on kids and what we know right now as a science and what we need to know in order to kind of figure that out and where there might be some opportunities uh, for benefits for, for kids. So digital natives, um, this is a CNN lead story, the war between the natives and the immigrants is ending, the natives have won. So um, mobile technologies have really taken over all of our lives in various ways, except for John who tells me that he doesn't tweet. Uh, so, uh, so, so some, some, some more, more than others, but I think this is probably, uh, we're probably experiencing one of the most rapid changes in terms of adop ad adapting and adopting technologies, and, and kids really are kind of a prime example of watching how their development is shaping and unfolding with this. And so here's just an example. Um, I left UVA in 2004, a lot has happened since then. 
Um, 78% of kids now own a mobile device, and that's between the ages of 12 and 17. If you go by age, this gets a little bit higher, right at the upper end, virtually all older adolescents are, earning, are um, owning mobile devices, and we're seeing device use coming online at younger and younger ages. So my four-year-old recently asked me for a cell phone. <laughs> and um, so I, you know, instead of saying no, I kind of probed a little bit. I said, you know, honey, why do you want a cell phone? He said, well, he somebody texts me. Um, and I didn't want to break his heart and let him know he had to learn to read before the text would be valuable. But, uh, but you kind of get the idea. He's seeing this, and it's a very salient, salient thing to him. But um, mobile technologies and ownership is, is very high among kids. We're seeing them interacting with them a lot. And so initially, what our idea was to use them as a research tool to try and use tools from their world to kind of connect and gather more information, maybe more reliable information from kids. Um, with 95% of the teens online, then having a cell phone. Uh, texting becoming really the dominant form of communication. So in our study, we actually just canceled the voice calls, or the voice features of it, because we were told um, that it was rude to call them. If they needed, we needed to get in touch, just text. So um, parents and teens might, might get that. And, and we're also seeing that this might be an increasing portal to kids that we might not necessarily have captured in some of our interventions or in some of our research studies. Um, but the fastest growing uh, adopters of, of mobile technologies are kids from low SES backgrounds and minorities. And so what we asked initially is whether or not mobile and virtual technologies could be used to understand adolescent and health risk behaviors. And I'm going to take you through an, a little example of that. Um, the method that we used was ecological momentary assessment. Of course, this is not a new method. This has been around for a very long time, right? So diary studies where we go in and get really intensive measures on individual daily lives. Um, this gives us a lot of advantages, things that we like to do as either prevention scientists or people interested in, in the effects of context, is to be able to capture kids in their context and life as it occurs. We think it might be able to reduce some recall bias, capture variability, reactivity and behavior. So this isn't a new method. I'm not saying that um, putting a diary study onto a phone is an entirely new method. I think it's providing us a few more opportunities for discovery along the way. Um, we now have wireless sensors, GPS, video and voice diaries that can help us a little bit with this. Um, and so what, what motivated us first using these as tools is kind of looking at the research and developmental science and thinking that we really know a lot about the effects of extreme events. So maltreatment, <coughs> early adversity, there's been a lot of focus. We know less about how the routine activities of daily life might be affecting kids. So something that's crept back up into the literature a lot recently has been this 30 million word gap, right? The difference in the amount of words a child hears in the day and growing up in a lower income versus a higher income um, uh, setting. Right. And, and the idea is kind of becoming increasingly salient that it might be that these daily experiences, or as a former mentor of my <coughs> person called it, the drift, drift, drift of daily life may be just as important, if not more important, than understanding the effects of these extreme and traumatic types of exposures. So what we wanted to do was to use the cell phones to try and capture life as lived among kids who were navigating pretty high risk circumstances, so they're recruited from higher neighborhoods, where there's a lot of violence, disorder um, in their schools and their neighborhoods, and understand kind of what, how, what life looked like from their vantage point on a daily basis, um, and, and how they were reacting to these kind of exposures to stressors in daily life and in real time. So um, this is a study in California. We, we um, recruited 150 adolescents and their parents. So for 30 days, three times a day, we texted and received surveys from them. And we initially started the study, we thought, okay, this is going to be a pretty high burden. And we spent a lot of time with our research group thinking about how to incentivize kids to respond. So it turns out um, that we didn't need any incentives to get a 90% response rate. When we, when their phone dinged, they respond. And so with virtually little effort on our part, they're responding. And I was also paying for their cell phone bills. And so anyone who was a parent of an adolescent, you know, oh. <laughs> so uh, I'm not looking forward to that. But being responsible for 150 adolescent cell phone bills gave me a, a real appreciation for how they were using their phones, what they were doing on their phones, and how often they were using their phones, right? So the average um, teen I now, now sends, about, sends about 60 text messages so older adolescent girls send about 100 text messages per day, boys send about 30, so that's a lot of time on your phone, so we were just kind of in the mix, right? So that was kind of lesson number one that 
while they're very highly engaged with their phones, they're pretty highly responsive, we didn't see a lot of change over time in terms of them just responding to our survey. We kept the surveys very short um, when we did, um, we, we, we pinged them, but we didn't see a lot of drop off over the course of the study. And this was really surprising, right? This is really surprising. We're in a high risk neighborhood with kids who don't, may not necessarily have a track record of engaging research, and we're getting this, this incredible response rate. Um, and then we followed them up 18 months later. Um, so this is just kind of the design of the study. At baseline, we had the kids and the parents come into our lab and did the kind of assessments that, that we'd like to do. We got reports from both of them. We did some um, mixed methods work, and this was really kind of, I know this, this is valued very highly here, and this was invaluable for us in terms of gaining some insights in terms of how parents were thinking about new technologies, the fears that parents had about monitoring their kids, use of technology, and how they were trying to use technology to monitor kids. And so a lot of the complex kind of issues came up that weren't in our traditional battery. Right. So as a delinquency research, when I asked about parental monitoring, I asked mom and dad, so do you know what your kid did today? At the end of the day, you get this kind of summary. That's not the way parents and kids communicate today. Right? So our way of thinking about kind of just that construct of how kids are monitoring parents and monitoring behavior changed a lot through, through taking the time to do these qualitative, this qualitative work with and so we, we also um, had this kind of really overdone training that we were going to give the kids on how to use the phone. <laughs> so we didn't need that. Uh, we didn't need that at all. And so the kids took, uh, took our devices. We wanted to, um, you know, at this point, I think we launched the study in 2010. So it, it was younger adolescents. So these were kids under the age of 15 in high-risk neighborhoods. Not all of them had a cell phone. They certainly didn't all have a smartphone. So we give them unlimited texting. Um, which now that I'm on the IRB, I don't know that I would let people do that <laughs> anymore, but uh, we, we were able to do that then. Uh, and, and you know, followed them through for 30 days, three, three times a day, and then 18 months later, we followed up and did some assessments of how they were doing in terms of education, mental health, and some biomarker assessments at that time. And so I just want to um, share a couple of findings from that study and then um, talk about what we learned with the mobile devices, because I think there might be a couple take-home lessons that are of interest to people here who are thinking about this approach and then switch to how we started to kind of shape our thinking about how devices might be affecting kids. So we wanted to know whether or not exposure to violence has these immediate effects on kids, so can we pick it up in their behavior and their affect and their sleep? Um, we had done some previous work, this graph represents previous work we've done in the lab, where we had brought actually models that got a twin into the lab that were discorded for bowling experiences, and we exposed them to the traditional kind of psychosocial stressor test. So they had to get up and give a speech, they had to, um, solve a type of math problem, and then we looked at cortisol response. And what we find there, um, and this is a little bit harder to see, so I'll just kind of give you through it here. This is kind of them getting used to us, you know, being in a weird lab setting, right, they come down to baseline. Um, these are the kids down here who have a history of childhood maltreatment, right, and you can see they have a blunted response, cortisol response, after the stressor. Um, and these are, this, is, these are, this is the rest of the sample, and this is kind of the average curve for the response. So we saw that in a laboratory setting, this kind of wanted reaction to stressors among kids with a history of maltreatment. We wanted to know what happens out there in the real world when kids are exposed to stressors in daily life, right? Is it the case that they have this kind of wanted response behaviorally, that they're not reacting in the same way, that they get kind of numb to experience? <coughs> and then we also collected some genetic data. We wanted to know whether some, re some adolescents were just more reactive in daily life and whether or not that kind of reactivity predicts long-term outcome. So um, here's a low reactivity, an event happens, an event doesn't happen, this is the same kid, and here's kind of the heightened reactivity. So the nice thing um, about this method with the cell phone and the repeated measures, and I was a student of John Nestor's when I was here as well, so we spent a lot of time looking at inter-individual variability, and this is really kind of the roots for thinking about how to analyze and work with these data, um, you know, time with John, is it's using this idea that I'll compare myself today when there's no event to what happens to myself tomorrow when there is an event. And we can control for those kind of fixed effects that um, allow a little bit more um, strength and causal inference around some of these things that have been really hard to compare. So um, what did we do? Uh, the kids, when they walked around in kind of their daily lives, they reported on exposure to violence. So things that they saw in their neighborhoods, in their schools, in their families. They reported on exposure to substance use. They reported on a number of things of kind of what they were doing. We got what they were doing, what they were doing in terms of their substance use, their fighting, bullying, helpless behaviors, how they were feeling, um, their sleep, their diet, and their exercise. Right? 
And so a pretty comprehensive battery to look at what were the effects of these kind of daily shocks uh, on, on, on multiple veins of functioning. And then these are just the analyses that we, we used, which I mentioned a little bit before. So these are odds ratios, and these are within person comparisons. So this is an odds ratio of about three, and this is just a measure of irritability. So how irritable am I today when I don't experience violence versus yesterday when I did experience violence? And we see that on days when kids are experiencing violence, we have heightened risk kind of across the board in terms of Irritability, which you think is important, it's a key symptom of a lot of mental health disorders. Engaging in health risk behaviors, behaviors that can put the kid at risk. Conduct problems, so lying, stealing, cheating, just feelings of anger, feelings of depression. And then we looked over to see whether effects carry over to the next day. So how long does this shock or these effects last? And we're still detecting effects for irritability, some behavioral measures, depression, and then reports of next day, how tired they're feeling. Right. So this is the same kid as using the kid as their own control of the time. Um, the other thing that we find, and um, these are observations again, here's the one point. Um, the bars in the red here are those kids who've had the highest exposure to violence across the series. So these are kids who we follow in the communities and they've, received, they've been exposed to violence the most during the time that we've been following them. Right? So they're in the highest exposure settings. And then the kids in the blue are in the lowest exposure settings. And we see this kind of parallel to what we see in the lab work. It's not a direct parallel, we're using biological markers in the lab, we're using behavioral measures um, kind of out in the, in the wild, and uh, what you see here is this heightened reactivity, right, among kids of lower, um, lower exposure, and this, you would call it a blunted response to kids who are just constantly being inundated with violence exposure. And then we also look at some genetic markers, so there's this idea that individuals who are carriers of the DRD4 that are familial, which is been implicated in conduct disorder, and thrill seeking, and ADHD, those types of things. Um, there's also this idea that it might be implicated in kind of the uh, degree to which you're reactive to environmental stimuli, both positive or negative. And kids, there's about 30 percent of our sample that were um, carriers of the DRD4 of seven, and they're in the red. And you can see that they had heightened reactivity to the stressors when they when they occur. So a lot of the comparisons prior to this have really been about comparing. Um, groups of people on a single outcome, and here we're looking within individuals, do they have the highest reactivity um, <clears throat> over time? So um, how do adolescents react to positive events and uplifts? I'm talking to a bunch of people who are really interested in positive youth development. Um, we, like a good, good psychologist, we already did a really bad job of measuring positive experiences and uplifts. We really tried. Um, we met with Andrew Kalini before we launched the survey. We, we tried to include as many measures as we could, um, but we did leave an open-ended section for them to talk about the positive things that happened to them during the day, and we, we coded that and have integrated those into kind of a new measure in our, in our new study. So we don't have great measures of positive experiences in daily life. We didn't do a great job on that in the first study, in our study now in Durham. Um, we've been looking at that, and the reason that we're interested in that is that there's this idea that kids who might, as many of you probably know, um, this idea of different susceptibility that the kids that we typically thought of as the most at risk or the most vulnerable based on individual or genetic factors might also be the most reactive to positive experiences when they happen, right? And we wanted to be able to test that in a daily, in daily life, right? Versus testing the way it's traditionally been done between two groups, one who's received the treatment and one who hasn't, right? So are the kids who are carriers of the J4 or carriers of these other um, markers or traits, are they moving the most in a positive and in a negative reaction uh, direction when these events occur? So this is work by my graduate student whose dissertation actually um, examined this, and the labels are a little bit misleading, but this would be a susceptible adolescent, so when a negative event occurs, they're more reactive. When a positive event occurs, they're just more reactive. So this is the same individual over time, right? And this would be a, I would say, non susceptible, but a less susceptible adolescent. So we're, we're in the process of trying to sort that out now. Um, we have some in, initial, some preliminary evidence of that from our first study, but again, we did a really bad job of measuring kind of positive experiences and uplift um, in the lives of these kids. So um, there's some limitations, obviously, with the study. We're still relying on primarily self reported exposure to both the events that are occurring and their um, reaction to those events. Um, one of our things that we've done is we've moved to these 
wireless sensors that everyone's wearing to track how many days, you know, or how many steps they're taking in a day. Um, this one is our favorite, and um, you know, like the two mobile programmers that I have now are kind of tracking my anxiety level um, at the moment. It's really so bad. Uh, but the reason, the reason that we, we decided on this, we spent a lot of time reviewing the, these types of trackers. We wanted to reduce the burden of, on the subject members of reporting these types of things. So in the morning, we don't necessarily want you to record the amount of sleep that you had. We can get that from your watch. Or we don't necessarily have to re, you know, figure out, um, you tell us where you are, we can get that from your watch or from your phone. So we're trying to figure out what's the information that we can get. Um, you're all looking a little bit scared, like I, I am uh, measured in your... <laughs> yeah, the funny thing is, this is a whole other discussion, is, is kids and privacy and kids' expectations of privacy are very different um, than, than what I would want tracked on me, right? And so it's, it, it's one of these born digital type issues where um, what their expectations are and, and what their fears are are just completely different on the privacy front. And whether that has negative long-term consequences for them, it yet yeah. But um, the kids, you know, they, they seem okay with this. So, um, so the reason we like uh, this watch versus a lot of the other kind of commercially available Fitbit is it, um, there's some pretty good data that it captures sleep reliably. So um, amount of REM sleep, um, amount of interruptions. I'll show you um, my end of one experiment. <coughs> so this is my um, sleep score. You see, Dick, I still don't sleep. Five hours and 33 minutes on Friday. Um, you know, so you get toss and turn, you get the amount of REM sleep, you get the light sleep. And the interesting thing about this watch is they've actually done some work in the lab where you take people in and hook them up to state-of-the-art uh, uh, indicators of, of REM sleep, and you get about a 4.3% discrepancy in the data. So it's, it's, they're, they're getting pretty good. Um, so my N of 1 experiment here, so that's my quality of sleep. I have a 63% sleep score. This is me. I was at a hotel recently without my children, and I'm just <laughs> Uh, so I'm convinced. Uh, <laughs> data from here. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's that's where we're trying to take to take this work. We're also trying to think about. Um, we're certainly working on the positive end of our assessments, and we're certainly trying to think about ways that we can experimentally, experimentally, mentally um, induce some of these things with kids. Right? There's a huge selection in terms of what kids report, how they're feeling, how they perceive events. Um, the positive outlook, um, uplifts, um, most of the content analysis shows it's when they get something, right? And sometimes that's a compliment or encouragement, but a lot of times it's things. Um, and so lottery type, uh, type paradigms will work there. We've been had a little um, more trouble with the stressful exposure. The one thing we know works is when you turn off their phone. Uh, and and, and be actually being serious, so we, we included um, in that initial study as filler questions on days when they weren't engaging in a lot of antisocial behavior, questions about technology use, addiction, withdrawal, um, how they felt when they were separated from their phone. Uh, and those, those data are turning out to be kind of really, uh, really interesting in terms of uh, you know, addiction levels. I was, I was talking about this one with my undergrads and, uh, recently, and one of them said, uh, in, in a class said, you know, I lost my phone the other day, and I can't even describe to you the way it felt. I just couldn't stop thinking about it, like, when am I going to see my phone again? I don't know what's going to happen to my phone? Is my phone okay? I felt lost. Like, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't do anything. Like, my entire life has been turned upside down. And I kind of looked at her, and I thought, okay, well, I've driven off with my phone on the top of my car twice. <laughs> Two weeks? So that makes you more digital than me digital. Yeah, because I'm bonded on my phone. <laughs> I didn't realize until after you know track it down on the highway somewhere. But um, so, so that so that was kind of, kind of an interesting end of one anecdote. But um, so just to kind of summarize, I think you know in terms of the opportunity part of this from a research end, we found it to be really valuable to capture kids in context. And along the way, that we found it um, some kind of interesting advantages in terms of their compliance in reporting. Some interesting new ways we might be collecting data on their context that might map onto things that we're really interested in. And it's pretty cost effective. So for $22 a month with our contract with <coughs> Verizon, provided you lock down their international texting, um, uh, you can collect you know, unlimited data, right? And so this is getting cheaper and cheaper all the time um, to, to do this. Um, unobtrusive measurement, so this could be a real benefit for a field that relies a lot on self-report. And then I think there's some, you know, a lot of potential benefits for basic and for intervention science. If you think about um, you know, delivering boosters through mobile phones, if you think about just tracking the progress with these um, pools of the kids that you've been studying that are really difficult and expensive to follow up with, you know, can you do kind of a quick burst of assessments 
to try and get some, some more data on how they're doing to evaluate kind of treatment heterogeneity and, and how things are happening. So I think there are a lot of opportunities. Um, so we began, as, as the title of the talk um, kind of foreshadowed, we, we began this process using this as a tool, but in our interactions with the kids and their parents, the technology itself soon started to become kind of the central um, player in all this. And I noticed pretty quickly that most of the undergraduates working in the lab were very interested in this part, <laughs> right? Um, and, and in part because it was a story about, about them and the role of technology um, kind of in, in their lives and how they, how they were using it. And um, you know, it's no, it's no secret that adolescents love their phones. I think some of us might love our phones. Um, you know, apparently, the best sign of addiction with cigarettes is how, often, how long it takes, or one of the best symptoms is how long it takes from the time you get up to the time you need your first cigarette of craving. So how long does it take from the time you get up to the time you check your cell phone? How many of you sleep with your cell phone by your bed? Near your bed? Okay. You're not alone. Uh, four to five adolescent cell phone owners sleep with their phones, right? And in uh, call up focus groups, these were data from Pew, they report being afraid of kind of missing a text, so it's bad for them not to respond during the night, which relates to one of our fears. Um, it, it's a period where connectivity, so adolescence is a period where connectivity is crucial, right? Relationships, communicating with peers. And what a better way to do it than through a mobile device that allows you to have these quick exchanges. So in many ways, it kind of fits this developmental period. Ideally, it's a time of heightened reward sensitivity, right? Dopamine system is activated. It's very rewarding to get new information. How many of you just want to check your phones right now? <laughs> Can you wait till the end? <laughs> um, and then there's these high levels of reported, you know, reported attachment that you know that we, we find kind of anecdotally in the so, um, so this is my student Madeline Jordan. We started, you know, when we were talking to our parents. Part of the open-ended question we had a, a I mean, that was part of this, and part of our conversation was about monitoring using technology to monitor your kids. And parents started to ask us for advice about what was appropriate. Right? They were worried about things at what age their kids should be using different devices, what their kids were doing online, um, whether it was be able their ability to develop real social skills. And so we started to ask, you know, is this, um, you know, how common are these fears among parents and educators, right? And, and then what's the science behind them? So what do we actually know about the effects of new technology? We all sit around and we talk anecdotally about, oh, kids today, they have no social skills, they're just always on their phone, you know, it's going to be terrible, they're never going to get a job. But it turns out that adults always say this about kids, right? So, you know, kids, kids today are, are always doing something wrong. And, um, you know, you see this through, Review radio exposure of these kind of new technologies, comic books, video games, and in some places, some cases there, there were real negative effects. Right, so I'm not downplaying that, but um, we wanted to kind of stop and take stock of what what we might know about these fears and how common uh, these, these these fears were. So we. Um, we started to review uh, media stories, which I know is not the most trusty source, but it, I mean, it's it's a reflection. It can be a reflection of what people are thinking about. It can also be um, influencing fears that the parents and others might have. We wanted to check this against large-scale survey data of what parents were reporting about fears on mobile techniques. So we did that as well. And then we checked this also um, with some of our interviews, which gave us some of the ideas to kind of what, what to look for. And I'm not saying these are the only fears that parents or adults have about kids, but these were the fears that we identified kind of through these three sources, and we felt like there was a reasonable amount of information that we could go in and evaluate what is the science actually saying, and what do we need to know. And so we have a review article um, uh, on this that I'm happy to share. So the first one is safety. You know, and this has been a constant one from kind of the age of the internet, when the internet first came online. So who are they talking to? And this is one, um, one of the areas where it really highlights this divide in the research and where a lot of the confusion comes up. So for internet use, the amount of kids that were using the internet when these studies were conducted was much lower. How kids were engaging online was much lower. So maybe they're going to chat rooms versus texting with each other or communicating with friends. So there's some of the confusion in literature about um, who, whether or not high use is bad for kids, for example, <coughs> gets really confused by mixing these two separate forms of, of research. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, Cyberbullying, there's been a lot of research on that. Is it creating new victims, or is this a new tool? Is it an exasperating problem? Um, alone together, so are kids today just 
no social skills, right? Are they missing out on important opportunities for social development because they're using their devices so much, right? And this was something that I wondered as I was paying the bills. <laughs> are these kids going to school? Do they, you know, what do they do? Um, they talk on my phone. Uh, are they talking on my phone? Um, are they getting someone else online? So this is something that's come up in terms of identity development. So how are kids seeing themselves in this virtual world? Are they the same person offline as they are online? Um, and are there opportunities for kind of identity exploration, which is an important task of, of adolescence. Um, this digital divide, this came up a lot in our interviews of um, this fear that mobile technologies could be creating a divide between parents and children, that they might be missing out on opportunities to, to talk to each other, um, that there might be increasing distance. Impaired cognitive performance of so this generation has been nicknamed Generation M for generation multitasking. Right, and we know that um, multitasking isn't necessarily good for cognitive performance from a lot of other studies. And then, you know, are they losing their sleep? So, um, in the interest of time, I want to leave room for discussion because this is always a topic that people have a lot to say, and I learned a lot. I'm just going to kind of highlight what we think we know, um, what we think we've learned from reviewing the research on on these points. And I want to um, preface this by saying that the research is a hot mess in this area. So there's a lot of people weighing in, right? So there's national <laughs> survey firms which are giving us kind of the prevalence of use. Um, there are a lot of people interested in it, so the popular media is, is actually conducting some of their own surveys. Um, software protection companies are, uh, you know, McAfee has a number of kind of scare tactics to sell their, uh, their parental monitoring devices to kids. And then in the academic literature, this is just coming from a lot of different sources. Right, so there's very few, very few experimental studies. Most of it's um, most of it's correlational, um, and it's coming from a lot of diverse disciplines. So kind of um, computer adaptive learning, um, case studies, some larger studies. Not a lot of longitudinal work, just because of the nature of how quickly this is changing. So this really is a moving target. So what I'm sharing with you now are some of the studies that we found the most compelling on, on each one of these points, and I'd be happy to talk. About about what was missing. So who are teens connecting with? And this is um, one of the fears. So who, is my, who are my adolescents talking to? Who, who is my adolescent talking to online? Um, and just consistently, offline and online networks are very similar, right? So there's a very strong overlap, and especially if you look at contemporary research. So all the research on kind of the internet was a little bit different um, in terms of the, percent, the types of kids that might have been kind of users and using at that time. But now if you look and you go through either through self-report data, or Mary Underwood has a really great study, it's called the Blackberry Project, in which she actually got the texts of 176 um, young adolescents for four consecutive days, and they did a content analysis on this, figured out who they were talking to, what they were saying. Right. So um, one of the few studies that haven't relied on self-report. Um, and what they find is this tremendous overlap. So 70% of the text messages are between peers, 21% romantic partners, 3% of parents and 1% other adults. So that just tells who, it doesn't mean the content, so you can't read the size really just yet. Um, there's also this huge over overlap in terms of um, social networks, so the majority of social network friends are also in-person friends. Um, and most of the content is positive or neutral, and this is the main finding among younger adolescents. There's this finding among older adolescents that's been pretty controversial, and this is around the issue of sexting, so sending nude pictures of themselves or sexually, sexually explicit uh, material. And this was actually relevant to us because the, the week we launched our study in California, there was a report that came out and said, that said one in five kids has sent a naked picture of themselves or someone else, and kids were getting charged with trafficking child pornography. So I actually stopped my study at that point as a new assistant professor and went, Okay, <laughs> back to the drawing board and spent six months with um, engineers at Verizon and our Office of Information Technology to try and figure out how our, you know, our devices were not going to be used in the commission of a crime. You know, so my lawyer friends couldn't really tell me if I was going to be in hot water or not, and I didn't feel like um, you know, I knew enough or had enough protection to, to figure that out. So that, that, was, that was kind of a fear that we had going, going into this. But, um, you know, the estimates are, are fairly high. The, the question is whether or not, I and mean, this is reflective of what kids usually talk about or do, is clearly a new medium and one that can have lasting consequences as these pictures and information is forwarded. So I think that that's a new threat that's been introduced, but whether or not it's actually changing the content of what they're doing. Maybe Joe has some insights on this from his work. Um, 
So fear number three, this is the idea of alone together. So you walk across campus, um, you walk and see a group of high schoolers, and they're together, but they're all on their phone, right? And the popular media, this has been phrased as, you know, being alone together, you know, why we expect more from technology and less from each other. So Sherry Turkle, a professor at MIT, made kind of a big splash in talking about this. Um, and the fear here is that kids are going to miss out on really important opportunities for social development, right? Interaction with their peers and others. And it turns out that um, self-report data uh, suggests that more time connecting online um, equals more in-person time and higher frequency. So kids who are online a lot with their friends are also offline a lot with their friends and engaging in kind of high frequency communication. And this is something across all the seven fears that we reviewed. The offline risks are really mirrored online and vice versa. Um, there's some longitudinal data from the study of um, the panel study on income dynamics, and this showed that children with stronger relationships early in life actually became more frequent users, and adolescents had maybe more friendships, uh, networks to talk to, to, to connect with, and they in turn, um, in adolescents, reported stronger connections and friendships. So this was this kind of rich get richer hypothesis in terms of strong early connections leading to strong related connections. Um, this is one of the few experimental studies, um, and this is. There was initially in the conditions, adults and, and adolescents, very similar effects across both of them. But they, the condition was you had this um, experimentally induced social exclusion task. So one group experienced it. Um, and, and those who saw the instant messaging versus solitary gameplay after that, then after that manipulation, they reported um, reductions in negative aspects as well as a lot of other kind of pos more positive Perceptions of self, for example. So it seems like um, you know the alone. There's not a lot of support for this idea that kids are just online and missing out on these opportunities to connect. That they're online connecting with friends and in potentially important ways, strengthening friendships perhaps. But effects aren't really uniform, and they're, they're probably differential. And we should expect there to be differential effects. So some shy adolescents. This is work with college students. There's real benefits conferred with time spent online, developing new skills. But with kids who are depressed, there's some evidence over time that it exasperates depressive symptoms. Right. So again, not a one size fits all approach. Here. So just two more fears. Um, I didn't review all of them. I didn't want to, in the interest of time, um, do that. But I'm happy to talk talk about them. This, this digital divide is interesting. So are cell phones coming in between, you know, kids and their parents? Um, this one, this picture is kind of interesting. They just haven't been looked at as much. So the, the assumption is that it's kids use the problem, right, versus parents' attention. Um, and you know, as a parent, I'm guilty of this too. I have to have kind of time out uh, for my device time so that my attention isn't isn't redirected. But um, you know, the focus really has been on this as a problem for kids. But you know, what, everything we know about parental monitoring and, and what we do um, is and how that affects our kids should be brought into this equation. Also. So, um, so time spent online displaces time with parents, but it doesn't seem to influence the relationship quality, right? So we definitely see that this time use changes between parent between kids who are heavy users, but it doesn't seem to be drastic in terms of quality. Um, there's also some evidence of shared online activities really bolstering the relationship, and new technologies provide a lot of opportunities for parents and children who are separated by distance, right? So maybe through non-shared custody, maybe through a parent being overseas, or immigrant parents with um, has parents in another country, for example, that that can really maintain the relationship. Um, there's some nice work with um, a small sample, but nice work with college students showing how that helps with this transition to college, too, this frequent. And, and other people have other opinions about how that might hurt the transition to college, but, um, but uh, their findings seem to suggest that it's, that it's helpful. Uh, this monitoring issue of um, the digital divide. So it's clear that parents are starting to use devices to monitor their kids, and we were kind of surprised by the creative ways in which parents were using devices to monitor children. But again, it's those kind of basic things you know about parenting or shared trust, disclosure, and the findings, of course, seem to be that it matters who's doing the calling. So kids who initiate the calls, that's a signal of a healthy relationship. When parents, there's high contact and the parent is initiating, in those relationships, the parent tends to know less about the kids. Right, so we've known this from parental monitoring literature for a long time. Maybe it's not monitoring per se, but it's that child disclosure that matters. And again, I think we're seeing the same thing. So the lesson again is 
these basic things that we know about development, that we know about parenting, that we know about <coughs> kids, most of these things translate, right? And this isn't some mysterious new world that we're entering on those dimensions. Okay, so the last fear I'm gonna leave you with, and I'll leave you with this, because this has actually changed my behavior. So I find the evidence in this realm so compelling that I no longer allow cell phones in my bedroom, and I actually try and have, um, you know, I, I went completely paperless a couple years ago, and I've kind of backtracked on that, because the new experimental research really does show that there's this difference. If you're up late reading on a screen from the light emitted, that same material reading on a book or paper, that you have major disruptions in sleep, right? In the amount of sleep that you're getting, in the amount of REM sleep, we see delayed circadian rhythm, some melatonin differences. Um, and so, so there's some just really beautiful work that, that's showing that. And I, I find that pretty compelling that you know time in front of the device before bedtime really does have these disruptive effects. It seems, to, it seems to have these disruptive effects on sleep. And that's experimentally in a lab, right, with a pretty dry content. So let's take it out, out a step and think about um, an adolescent. Right, so um, most adolescents, the heaviest texting is after 9 p.m., right? Um, you add in some emotionally salient content to those text messages. That could be disruptive for sleep. And then you add in text that might be coming at all hours of the night just in terms of disrupting sleep. So I think for those of you who are interested in adolescent sleep, this is a fascinating area and one where there probably could be some interesting kind of recommendations, although I don't know how, other than a no devices in the bedroom rule, you kind of thwart some of this. But it seems, this is one of the fears that we reviewed where we went, yeah, that's, that's pretty compelling so far that there's some disruptions happening. Um, and this is, this is from a New York Times article, which is, um, our parents in our study didn't actually mention this, but this is, this is covered a lot in the, in the media. And this is um, a young boy who's under his blankets, you know, hiding his, his electronic use. I'm not really sure what that is, to be honest, you know, excuse the picture. But um, here they're calling it genome you know, mapping. Um, okay. So, um, you know, it, it seems for the most part when we went through and we actually looked at the social science and um, and been done in this area, and again with all the caveats that this field is just moving really quickly and it's really difficult to kind of capture what kids are doing and the content of that and to get really good research field that by the time you get a study funded to do this, everything kind of thing will change. You know? um, and, and it's and it's hard to keep up with with kind of patterns of use and what might be important. So it's a rigorous and fast moving um, field and you know, rigorous and fast-moving studies are, are, are sorely needed. Um, the effects really aren't uniform, and I think that's the way that we've been talking and thinking, of, thinking about the effects of new technology, but like any other effect of the environment on kids, um, there's going to be a lot of heterogeneity, and we've got to think about that. Um, and for us, as we reviewed this, what we, what we found, and maybe we shouldn't have been so surprised, but the discussion and the discourse around this was very negative, right, in terms of um, mobile phone use being a really negative thing for, for kids. And I'm not... Um, not saying as we see the number of text messages, I don't, it's got to re reach an asymptote <laughs> somewhere, so may maybe we're there. Um, but as we review these studies, what we were consistently finding were you know, some opportunities. So opportunities for greater connection, maybe greater contact with parents and children who are, are separated. You know, it's evidence of potentially strengthening relationships over time. Experimental evidence that it might help this bounce back from rejection for kids be an important way to elicit social support in the moment, kind of in this just in time intervention way. And so, as we reviewed it, um, you know, these ideas kind of kept coming up and were really generative to think about how we might be responding to kids as they need it in their context and really listening to kind of how they're using new technologies to kind of navigate their social worlds, their relationships, um, to deal with stressors as they encounter them. So, I think the future for kids still looks bright, um, but we'll need to move quickly to capture it. And I, I you know, found this a little bit exhausting to try and keep up and really rely on um, a lot of my undergraduates to make sure that I'm not making some antiquated reference to Facebook or something. You know, um, yes, you know, it, was, it was Snapchat for a while, now it's what's up. Okay, so so, um, so they should, pretty soon they'll be up here presenting this. But um, I think you know, on the research end that there's just these countless opportunities for us to think a little bit more creatively of how we might integrate you know, these low-cost tools that seem to be pretty compelling from the adolescent or the user end to provide us with some richer information and could be compelling to you know, research investigators who are looking for ways to kind of cut costs but still maintain that rich level of information they collect from the study members. 
Um, you know, for intervention, there's, um, there's a lot of hype around this, these kind of low cost micro nudges. Um, but, you know, it's testable, right? And so one of the nice things about these types of micro nudge interventions is you can get data pretty quickly and in real time, right? And then in the ideal situation, you're getting the data in real time, you're processing it, and you're adapting what gets sent back out to the person. So it offers a uh, an opportunity for kind of an individualized medicine or individualized intervention approach um, and allows us to kind of um, move a little bit more quickly um, in capturing what kids might need in their context and in the moment. Um, I think there, there are a number of open questions and I don't want to kind of leave with this idea that technology is it's all rosy and there's nothing to be worried about, but I did want to offer kind of a counterbalance to this idea that it's all bad um, for kids. And this is, it is the case that this is the first generation of kind of digital natives coming of age. So what does it, you know, what does it mean to have every aspect of your life captured, right? Without your consent in a lot of cases, right? So that ultrasound picture goes up on Facebook, right? You get tagged to your old birthday party. So everything about you is archived, right? Archived in a way. And what does that mean for the future, for for college entry, right, for employment, for political campaigns, when we just be so inundated with information that it won't matter anymore, um, for your own sense of identity. And this was really fa the fascinating part of the review for us when we started to think about how these events that were previously not captured on video or online, but are now captured and replayed for kids in a way that makes them increasingly salient, you know, both those positive experiences and those negative experiences, what does that mean to have those kind of memories um, positive and negative trending range are out there for a permanent record and replace <coughs> the lives of kids. Um, so I think that, you know, that's going to be an interesting question to understand how this online information is actually used as information in making these kinds of decisions and if it, actually, it has any effect on kids' mm -hmm. life chances. Um, but you know, I think to date, the most fears, that, the common fears that we saw, and again, this is non exhaustive, there was really little scientific basis um, so far that these. <laughs> really harming, harming kids in a way that we should be worried about. Um, so with that, I'm going to thank um, a lot of the people that, that contributed to the to My Life Project and to this newer work, and um, I will take time for questions and discussion. Uh, Candice, your uh, final point was that uh, most fears have little scientific basis. But I must say, I wasn't too reassured by the data yeah. on who adolescents are texting. You said it's 70% peers and, quote, only, quote, 1% other adults. Yeah. Yeah. But if adolescent girls text 100 times a day, that means that there's only one other adult that my daughter has texted. Yeah. 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 Um, so a small, percentage, a small percentage of kids are texting people that are on. So it's a very small percentage. If you look at the, you know, the fear of kind of solicitation by strangers or close to strangers work, there's a really nice paper on the psychologist that really shows this mirroring of offline risks, um, being the most predictive of who becomes sexually solicited online, and you know whether that progresses to anything that's in person. And so this doesn't exactly answer your question, but I had the same concern with those those frequencies. But um, essentially, just posting or sharing information online doesn't increase but it's the way that kids are engaging or having conversations online, what kind of information they're sharing in those ways um, that, that heightens risk, and those can be predicted from kind of offline risk factors. So um, what you know about your kid offline is a pretty good indication of what they're doing online on average. I mean, you know that. Yeah. You know you're allowed to do that. And I should say, you know, that last, I kind of struggle with that last sentence because it's kind of like, Null, right? So we don't have good data, so I can say that there's no fear. Like, you know, I, just to date, there haven't been those kind of compelling studies that have, that have, that have shown that, but that doesn't mean that, that could be just because we don't have it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe you just covered this, but the statement that the fears aren't supported, there's no research supporting it, it also sounds like two things. One is we aren't really sure how to capture the phenomenon, and then secondly, we haven't really studied it enough to no way that those fears are unfounded. Yeah, and that's, that's the major point we make in the, in the article is that people have been really focused on this frequency question. And because in the older work, high frequency users were at high, high risk, but they were also a highly selective sample. And that we haven't got much beyond the frequency of how often kids are doing this to understand 
the content of what they're doing online, um, how that's correlated with other online behaviors and offline behaviors. So you're you're right. The major point that we, we make in the article is that um, here's what we know. It's not a lot. Um, it, it supports it's it presents more opportunity than fear. But here's what we really need to understand this. Um, because the flaws in the it, it, it is a mess. The, the, the technology makes the problem different, but universally the problem is somewhat the same as generations ago because if you think about it, several generations ago people struggled with should I give my adolescents their separate phone line and let them be plugged in all times to their social network or should I allow them to have a television in their room, which all seems very, you know, old now. But um, it was a similar problem. I mean, is there are there similar findings that people study this, or is this something that is is even relevant if people look at that back then and what fears sort of translate from that? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think um, it's hard because the way in which kids are using technology changes. So it's all gone into one, right? So fears you might have about media, what we know about exposure to my private media is now on your phone. What we know about gaming, you know, gaming is now. So it's it's more the constant access, right? Um, when there was a home computer, there could be more opportunities for monitoring, but parents really worry now that the phone goes with the kid, right? And so unless you're policing the phone, um, you're policing the contact that happens, and then you, know, you have this issue of trust with your child, right? So how, and, and that's a classic parenting problem of that, how much, uh, how much is that happen? I don't know so much a question that's something I've been thinking about is you were looking at younger adolescents, but that, that one of the bigger fears I think about is the interaction of driving and the addictions mm -hmm. to phones and and how that seems to be a big, big area. Mm -hmm. it, I've done some reading recently about how yeah. we really actually have trouble not responding to that sound effect. So I, I read a study recently that more the greater percent of adults have yeah. driving than adolescents. Mm -hmm. Right, but there are other issues with adolescent driving. And, and there's actually, I think, I could have this wrong, but I think, you know, so Larry Steinberg has all these great studies of kind of peer influence, right? And what kind of decisions you make in the car when peers are there versus not. And what if the peer is virtually there, right? And so there's this divided attention, but there's also this <coughs> dynamic that's, that's playing out um, that you, you actually have someone virtually in the, in the car with you as well. And I, and I think there's actually a new study uh, that the, the, I just reviewed this coming up again. Yeah. Comment on the question. First, I really appreciate your general attitude toward the fears that, you know, I think we're partly afraid because it's different. I mean, it's new and we're not familiar with it. And if you think about driving, you know, having two peers in the car, I think one peer in the car doubles your risk of an accident, having two triples and, and, and so forth in person. And if your daughter is talking to one adult at photos versus on your text, which would you be more you know, comfortable with? Um, but there's a fundamental change to the nature of social interaction that's going on. And it's kind of a leveling effect, which is we're alone less than we ever were, and we're intensely together without distraction less than we ever were. It's like all of our interactions kind of start to look the same. And, and I think that's not just true with adolescents, but just any thoughts about that as you kind of read the you know, literature and, and the literature for the kids. You know, I don't, I, mean, I think you probably have a better answer. <laughs> uh, you know, this whole idea of alone together, I mean, I, I think I found that compelling at first, like a lot of people did, and I think that's why the title kind of catches you, because visually, visually you get that. But, it, um, you know, it really is, I have a student who's interested in social, really interested in social support and how adolescents are using new technologies um, to access this kind of just-in-time support after, you know, all the and you know you can see some real benefits to that, but you can also see some real risks, right? If you're you're not you don't have that time alone to kind of reflect, you don't have the immediate um, go to you know you know the time to reflect, the process, what has happened, to make sense of it on your own, and you're reaching out to kind of to solicit information. And so um, I don't think there's there's probably an easy answer, and it's probably operates very differently from very different kids in different circumstances. And that's a typical development of psychologist answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You know, I'm curious, you know, so I assume the kids were taking their devices to school. Yeah. So schools vary in the policies yeah. that they have around that. And I'm 
curious about what your data say about that time when they're in the school day, and if you were able to glean any insights about the policies that schools have and yeah. how they matter. So the study in California, it was 150 kids, but they were spread out over a number of different school districts. And what we had to do was individually with each kid program it for time that they weren't in school. So we had a morning survey, which was very quick, which was programmed before they went to school. We had an after-school survey, which we captured information on what happened during the school day, so we weren't able to get kind of real-time information as they were going through their school day um, and uh, so we didn't we didn't really attend to that we got around the policies by just timing it to be after you know after and out of school hours and then we had another survey in the evening with that many do you know what kinds of the range of policies that school use and I mean is there anything written about this you know I don't know and I, my guess is that it's just it's changing in the same way that you know policies around cyberbullying have changed quickly as we try to keep up with Based on what you find, what would you recommend to a school leader? You should do what? <laughs> <laughs> How about having phones in the school? Right, so yeah, this is a high device device mission. And um, I, I wouldn't have them. I mean, I, I wouldn't have them in school for a lot of uh, a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, some of the most compelling, uh, you know, I don't know if it was an access where I'm getting information lately, like, the New York Times article. You know, I let students have laptops, devices, everything in my classroom. I'm sure this is a hot issue here. And my you know, assumption was that this is the way that kids learn now. This is the way that they interact. That this is where their comfort zone is. And you know, I guess they're, they're paying for it. So um, here they are. But it was pretty, you know, a pretty compelling experimental design. I'm forgetting the author on it now. That it had you know, basically assigned to bringing in and writing notes in kind of a traditional way, which shows you that, yeah, I shouldn't be worried about kids today and their laptops in my classroom. Um, versus kids who were taking notes online. Now that's a bit of a different question, but it's, it is a distraction. I didn't, I didn't cover the multitasking section here, but that's another area where it's, it's pretty clear from research and adults with really nice experimental studies that multitasking impairs cognitive performance, right? And those people who think they're really good at it are actually really bad at it. <laughs> and that holds for kids too. So um, yeah, it, it, the objective is, is learning. So just to clarify one thing first, and then I want to get your feedback on something. So the other adult wasn't necessarily a stranger, though, right? That was just not a parent that could be. In Marion's, yes, in Marion's study, it wasn't necessarily a stranger. It was okay. like another adult other than a parent. So it could have been a grandparent. Yeah, so this doesn't necessarily need to be something yes, to well, In fact, I, I mean, obviously, my research is on natural mentoring, but I know for formal mentoring, there's growing research around texting as a way of staying connected with, so that this is like a positive thing. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to get just your thoughts about, so this other study you presented was talking about comparisons between being uh, online texting versus like playing a game, you know, more alone, a solitary app. And there does seem to be a difference between being alone and texting. But I'm also wondering about if you're texting or you're fully engaging with your device and not engaging with peers, has there been anything kind of comparing that difference? So it's, it's not the same as being alone. Yeah. But it's not being fully engaged with peers or family at dinner yeah. or whatever it might be. Anything around or your thoughts about that? You know, so my my initial thought is one of the things I think that's that's challenging is the the rapid rate of saturation of the of this among the groups that were among kids, right? And so um, I think part of the reason that some of this experimental work hasn't been done is it's very you know it's very difficult to probably rep to induce those conditions. Um, it's very difficult to find kids who look the same but have very different patterns of engagement on their devices. Does that, uh, does that make sense? So it, it wouldn't be clear whether or not it was something about the kid and their existing relationships versus something about the communication. I mean, this is, this is a problem throughout all of this research is the correlational mm -hmm. nature of it. That, you know, Although maybe it can be experimentally manipulated, right? You can have kids come in with their friends and not be, I mean, I guess, yeah. but then you have the negative effect of not using their phone, right? right? But, right. <laughs> but maybe you could have them engaging in an activity yeah. versus like just being free to do what they want, which would probably be more right. fun use and then maybe do some of the same act. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, in this bestseller, The Shallows, the author's contention was that uh, all these media devices are actually physically rewiring the brain. Right. Yeah. Uh, do you see any evidence of this? Or do you think that's a reasonable 
Yeah, I don't know, and I think I don't think anybody knows. I mean, I think a lot of people are interested in this because adolescence has been framed as this period of kind of rapid, um, you know, pruning and kind of this use it or lose it hypothesis. And if this is what kids are doing versus other things, then it would make sense that something like that has happened. JB has a kind of a nice article summarizing his thoughts on this, but there's just very little. Here's the helpline. 
you know, this this survey, if you're feeling like you want to harm yourself, this survey is not the health line. This is the health line. And so being very explicit about that was you know, an important, a very important step. And until we get to the point where you can have that real time feedback, and I, and I think it would be too risky to do anything like mandated reporting and that like, hey, where you, you know, um, people, some engineers that I'm working with are, are dealing with ways to kind of comb through the text, identify flag, right. you know, warning signs, and then text, you know, a number to, to check that data. Yeah, because I remember Mary Underwood's Blackberry study, they had a situation where a girl went missing, and so they had IRB issues that they couldn't necessarily track her down, it was right. before they had GPS, you know, yeah. information in there, but um, I think they essentially ended up giving <laughs> IRB approval to text the girl at that time, email the girl, and say, we're going to turn off your phone if you don't call your parents, and right. that actually worked. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, but that's one of those real-time things that, you know, wasn't planned, and they, they had to work through a variety of issues about yeah. how to manage the child security. And, and I think there's working groups that are now emerging that think about this, but I'm part of one in, um, in April, and so people, that are inter people who are interested in intervention science and integrating these Technologies for that, and people who are also interested in the sensing, environmental sensing part, and you know, hopefully, out of those kinds of groups, we can get you know, maybe not policies, but resources for researchers who want to move in. Because it is high cost to start in this area, you know, to move in and kind of get the infrastructure to do this, and then low cost for additional studies. Right? Yeah. This is a different subject. So you have Verizon Wireless and Google up there. Yeah. Um, so what would be some lessons or some information since? That's not a it's way a most of us think about funding is industrial. Yeah. So what would you have to say about that? Really? Yeah, so this was, um, you know, the advice I got early was to diversify my portfolio. Right? You know, funding, I came in at a time where uh, 2008 was not a good year for anybody. And so I started to try and think more creatively about who might be interested in supporting some of this work. And so I think this was probably, you know, a naive young researcher going on approaching these things. I don't know if it would work the second time. But, um, uh, I think just, just to add, so the university already had a relationship with Verizon. I approached them through their foundation. They had grants they were giving out, and so they gave us logistical support. We got the phone essentially for free, um, you know, with some cost for the insurance. They, you know, they were pretty invaluable, especially because we had so much difficulty locking down the phones. So what, we just couldn't anticipate everything a kid was going to do with the phone at that time. Um, and so our bills were outrageous, you know, just outrageous. <laughs> Uh, to start with until we actually figured out what cost, you know, texting pictures and videos to Mexico actually cost. And the university, yeah, which allowed for the contact. And then um, Google was, it was interesting because they, they came onto campus and, uh, in California and Irvine, they have a headquarters there and they set up meetings with investigators <coughs> to do these faculty research awards. And because I was in psychology, they wouldn't let me meet with them. But my dog actually played with the, at the dog park with the DNA engineering. <laughs> so, uh, so I got the guys' contact information and I just got cold called them and it turned out that they were, this was a Street View project and they were also interested in putting together a working group at that time on whether or not uh, mobile technology, you know, they, they, they were the market for that in the research space. Um, and uh, they just, it, it just kind of worked that way. So I don't know, have a social dog. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, one of the things, this may be a faulty analogy, but the one thing you seem to come out very strongly about was you should put these things away when you go to bed. You should not uh, have had a picture there of whatever that machine was, <laughs> but it was it's hiding not underneath the covers. And I couldn't help but think, and it's a long time ago, but when I was a kid, we had a flashlight. Yeah. You'd go under, you'd have a book. And Parents were all concerned about, you're not going to get enough sleep. It's yeah. going to destroy the way you do things and so forth. And so uh, you both said you felt strongly enough about it. That you put the stuff aside now yourself, and you can yeah. see stuff. So I'm just wondering, you know, is this, what should we be doing? And why are you kids concerned? Yeah, so why I'm so concerned, this is a proceeding in National Academy of the Science study that was published. And essentially, this was very highly controlled, so it was in a lab. And it was reading off of an iPad, and so it was basically testing the light emitted from the screen, right? So there's different pathways that it can affect sleep, right? So it's the light emitted from the screen, it's the kind of just the actual time you spend doing it, um, or the arousing content of the material. 
right? So those things are controlled. They use the same information, the you know, from an iPad, same amount of time reading it, and then they have them hooked up and monitor sleep throughout that night and see circadian clock shifts, so melatonin release is different. They see differences, you know, the quality of sleep, the amount of sleep, the amount of interruptions. And so that to me was, was it was pretty compelling. You know, I'm not up at three in the morning texting anyone, so and I'm less concerned about, you know, the uh, around the part of it, but I was, you know, I, I took that seriously. It's someone who values sleep more and more. So I had another question about the reactivity, you know, uh, the, the findings earlier on. And is it good or bad to be reactive? There was a series of studies that came out of the Great Smoky Mountain yeah. study that uh, earlier this year about bullying had you know, low reactivity and that kind of caught on was it healthier to be a bully than to be a victim. And uh, I, I was like, wow, that's an interesting twist on that. So, you know, <laughs> the argument being low reactivity reduces your risk for cardiovascular disease in the lab. Right. That was the kind of angle that they were playing up on this. So I just wanted your, your take on the findings that you've seen and more broadly around the literature around the reactivity. Right, so the cortisol we would give a bit of a mess in terms of cramming your activity. I think the way that we thought about it was in terms of um, kids within these types of contexts, these high violence type homes in the neighborhood, if the stress response system could remain activated that long. And if there is this idea kind of allostatic load and the greater wear and tear on your body, the greater the activation and the greater the length of activation, then you think it would be actually adaptive to shut down. So if you're constantly in those types of settings, um, that there's some adapt adaptive strategy to not responding, you know, either maybe not perceiving it as threatening or maybe just the physiological response getting damp. And so that's, when we looked, saw that in the lab, that was the working hypothesis and we found support for that. And what I wanted to try and understand was, um, you know, in kind of daily exposure, what does that look like, right? And there's, there's places where that analogy breaks down, to be sure. Um, but this was, you know, intriguing to us that, you know, across that period, higher violence exposure, just less reactivity. And we tried to control for you know, the types of violence, you know, to make sure it wasn't a seriousness uh, effect. But, so that, was, that was our frame on it. Yeah, and that would be the right thing with logic. It's just interesting to think about the benefits of down regulation. Right. Do they outweigh the other psychological risks? Right. I didn't know if you would experience any conversation about the benefits of the down regulation kind of model or the low reactivity model. Yeah. So you mentioned that you, a couple of times, I think, perhaps in modesty, that you were more major and positive. Characteristics very well. So, and then uh, another thing I noticed was just when you look at the patterns of racism, the, the majority of attacks were neutral or positive. Um, and then to take off from Nicole's point, um, we might want to be very careful about our assumptions about what texting and adult means because it could be um, bad. It's mostly aunts and cousins and our people like that who are better. It's not this strange predator that. And so, and, and would we want our kids to be more attached to adults? And so, all that is by way of saying, asking uh, if you were going to talk about thinking about this in terms of positive development and as a, a way of maybe getting an insight into how kids are managed in their day to day lives well, what are some of the things you'd be looking to manage better? Yeah. So, I, I think we just have to get over this idea of frequency as the main indicator. Right, and that's this idea of internet addiction of kind of time passed. And you know, frequency is interesting, and it's kind of we all gasp when we see 100 text messages in the day, but it's the content. And so we need, you know, Marion's study is a nice example, but it's with select, you know, 176 kids, you know, younger adolescents, how does that look? And how, you know, they start to now look at kind of the core list, the offline core list of what the content of those text messages, how that correlates to mother reported, teacher reported behavior also. So I think kind of all the kind of good lessons we know about methodology of understanding developmental processes in general, we need to take them into this field, right? And because it's kind of a second or a new field, there's kind of shortcuts that are taken, right? That it's just interesting that um, we can track this, this use, but that's that's not enough, right? To really understand what the meaning of this is. And there's some there's been some really nice um, Lloyd had some really nice work, mostly a case study approach, looking at kind of the creative way that kids are using. 
um, messaging, um, and some of this is to kind of evade adults' knowledge of what they're talking about, but other ways to kind of maintain status in different social hierarchies, kind of the knowledge is power way, like to learn information, to be very resourceful, kind of gathering and managing and circulating that information. So it's it's pretty complex when you get, get into thinking about it at that level versus, you know, just how much, you know, what's the content, if you did a content analysis and mind it, but really what's the motivation, what's the function of it, and how <coughs> it kind of offline behavior, yeah. Um, so earlier you said about privacy, and you talked about that being a really big Um, parents are very concerned about privacy, right? And this isn't necessarily from our work, but just, just in terms of um, surveys in general, what parents worry about is what their kids are disclosing online. You know, that consistently comes up as a number one concern. Um, kids have been, the, the training has kind of shifted from early on. It was kind of, don't share this type of information because of sexual crimes, right? Um, and that was in a very constrictive um, kids are, I think, more tech savvy about what they're sharing than we give them credit for. But I think in a world where everything is recorded, um, the, the things that end up online are really less safe to them than they would be to me. Um, you know, and I don't think we have a lot of great research. A lot of writing about this has been kind of more of a philosophical view and case studies with kids. But um, my sense from, from that work and, and on that work is that it really is uh, these changing and from interacting with the kids. I mean, we expected just a lot more pushback, uh, a lot more pushback. The study that I would really love to do with the habit that I get is to collect the same information, pen and paper, right? So is, is, are they really feeling more comfortable disclosing online? So one of the working theories about how this affects the relationship is that adolescents may be more willing to self-disclose online, which breaks the bond in relationships, right? And so you'd like to know in our study, what, is there an actual difference of the, the media? I had a question about your sample. So you said that you provided all the cell phones. Were they smartphones? Yeah, so they were um, not a really nice version. They were an older, older model of a smartphone. Um, it was 2009, 2010 okay. um, when we gave them out. So not as many of the kids. I think 37% of adolescents now have a smartphone, but that number has really changed. So were these all kids who had smartphones before you did them? No, it was about 40% um, of the kids had one, and okay. they switched over. We, they, and those that didn't, didn't have the kind of unlimited texting perks, so all of the kids used our study phones. In our, what, we're now, what we now need to do, right, or, um, we've hired a couple of programmers who work with us, and one of the big tasks for them is making sure we can get the kind of lockdown things that we need for our security onto the phones of kids themselves, right? And that's a complicated task because kids are not going to carry two phones, right? You need to get into kids' phones, not our phones. So I was wondering if you had any concerns about introducing this potentially big yeah. yeah. into <laughs> yeah. the hands of kids in these low income, low resource. Yeah. So one of the reasons we use older phones was an ethical consideration. It could be a target. Oh, okay. Yeah. So one of the reasons we didn't use um, in addition to cost, was we didn't want, and in this current study also in, in um, Durham, we've actually tried to pick a mid-range phone for that reason that won't stand out or be a target for that. Okay. Um, that's one of the things. The other, the other concerns I've had, you know, especially with the younger adolescents, is you know there, there were these concerns about you know addiction and uh, that are we actually introducing some sort of risk if people are thinking about this in terms of risk, and that was part of our motivation to think. And what's the science behind that? What are we actually doing? Because we had just thought of it as a tool, like any other tool you would give a kid, maybe perhaps naively, until we started to understand really how important these tools were to their lives. And okay, thank you. Would you also comment on diversity in this sample? Yeah. Was, uh, both economically and yeah, so it was uh, recruited from low SES neighborhoods. It was mostly Latino. Youth in the minor, so it was about 60% um, Latino kids in Southern California, so Costa Mesa, um, yeah, typically. And so um, we had included a lot of kind of acculturation measures in our initial baseline, and some this was with a positive uplift um, measures. We had spent a lot of time thinking about what family connectedness might, might look like there, um, as well as how uplifts might play out a little bit differently. Okay, so you have not, have you started doing the Durham study yet? 
We have, yeah, and that sample's mostly African American. Well, it's split African American and white, so it's a, it's a bit of a different um, demographic, but it's, it's children living um, at about 150% uh, poverty line, so it's a, it's a low income sample. Um, and you didn't comment on uh, like extended family or. Um, yeah, so it's interesting you should ask that. So we have a pilot grant from the National Institute of Aging, and we are recruiting the kids' parents and grandparents into the study. So um, we want to understand, yeah. So, so part of it is that um, we're looking to embed these types of measures into ongoing cohort studies that have older, um, older groups of, of people. But the other part of this is um, working with economists and economists who is really interested in transfers across generations and communication across generations. I'm interested in monitoring and supports, and so we're, uh, we're trying to get some preliminary pilot data on, one, the feasibility of doing these intergenerational studies yeah. with the phones, uh, and whether or not we can capture you know, the same benefits of in-person versus virtual support and transfers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm gonna stick around if you have questions, so thank you.